The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, alternate James Bond with a Walter PPK that fires into the fifth dimension. Fortunately, the fifth dimension in that universe is not the popular R&B group, but a nefarious AI intent on enslaving all of humanity. After it marries Napoleon Bonaparte, that AI is going to get the wedding bell blues all right. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have Steve White talking about his very interesting new science fiction novel that's also kind of a genre-bending alternate history. The book is Her Majesty's American. It's set in an alternate future where America never had her revolution and England never lost her empire. Instead, the British Navy has taken to space, and our hero in the book is Naval Intelligence Officer Commander Robert Rogers. So stay tuned for that. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. We have some startlingly great free fiction and nonfiction at the Bain.com website. Hey, we have a new David Weber novella. This story is called Darkfall, and yes, indeed, it is set in the Honor Harrington universe. And remember that in October, the next entry in the Honor Harrington series debuts. That's Uncompromising Honor. It's going to be at Booksellers October 2nd. You can get a good long first drink from Darkfall and read it free on Bain.com front page right now. Brave New World, four centuries ago, the Calvin's hope set out from Earth. On board, colonists who knew they themselves would never again set foot on a planet's surface, but who hoped for a better life for their descendants, away from the Earth Union's corrupt politics. Now, generations later, Calvin's hope is about to reach its destination. KCR 12604 looked to be the perfect system for the colonists' new homeworld. The planet on which they planned to live was referred to as Earth's twin, but that was before the hammers fell. Two asteroids, both larger than the one that drove the dinosaurs to extinction, have rendered the planet uninhabitable. Light years from Earth, and with no hope of turning back, it seems all is lost for the crew of Calvin's Hope. But though all does seem lost, Captain Vincent Anderson and his crew aren't ready to roll over. They've come this far. Now they can make their own luck. Also up at the Bain.com front page is Love in the Time of Interstellar War a new story from multiple award-winning writer Brendan Dubois. Brendan is the author of the Dark Victory series, which depicts a desperate fight against alien invasion. The final entry in the series is going to be out in October. That book is Black Triumph. Love in the Time of Interstellar War is set in the same universe as Black Triumph, this gritty struggle against an almost incomprehensible alien menace that has invaded Earth. A decade ago, the alien creepers invaded, laying waste to much of the world and building vast domes from which they continued their assault against humanity. In the process, they destroyed most of the world's electronic capabilities. All satellites and aircraft were rendered useless hunks of metal. The creepers' domes are indestructible, save only against a nuclear bomb. Of course, there are plenty of such devices on Earth, but the trick is how to deliver the bomb and detonate it without blowing yourself up. It's a problem, one that Sergeant Walter Hart is about to face head-on in this month's free short story, Love in the Time of War by Brendan Dubois and Darkfall by David Weber, are both available to read for free on the front page at Bain.com, and they will be available long-term in the free ebook collection, Free Stories 2018, which is available for download at Bain eBooks. Check them out. I want to welcome Steve White to the podcast. Hello, Steve. Hi, Tony. Good to be here. Vietnam veteran Steve White is the author of numerous science fiction and fantasy novels, including Wolf Among the Stars, St. Anthony's Fire, and Blood of Heroes. With David Weber, White collaborated on Starfire series novels, including New York Times bestseller The Shiva Option. 
He continued the Starfire series uh, with co-author Charles E. Gannon and others, including the latest entry, Oblivion, which was out this year. He's also the creator of a series of great time travel adventure uh, science fiction novels featuring tough guy and intrepid agent Jason Thano. That series' latest entry is Gods of Dawn. Now out at Booksellers is, is a new science fiction novel in a new sort of universe um, from Steve White. It's called Her Majesty's American. It's an interesting hybrid in that it is science fiction, but it also involves alternate history and an alternate future even. Uh, Steve, can you explain this, this interesting combination of genres that makes Her Majesty's American rather different and, and very interesting? Typically, most alternate history fiction that you read takes place in the present day. The idea being, what would the world be like today if the South had won the Civil War or if Hitler had won World War II or whatever? I, however, wanted to do a space adventure, so I'm taking an alternate history that begins with the American Revolution getting patched up and extrapolating it forward into the late 23rd century. Now, in, in my assumption here is as follows. Uh, in actual history, the British Empire w wasn't sustainable for the simple reason that it got too big relative to its power base, which was one little island. I'm assuming that in this alternate history, the British eventually succeed in incorporating North America and later other colonial areas as well into the power base so the power base grows to the point where the empire is sustainable and therefore it's been able to last into the late 23rd century and in fact has gone interstellar so where was the what was the break point um in real history in this alternate future I firmly believe that in the period right after the repeal of the Stamp Act in 1766, the American Revolution could have been averted on the basis of imperial reform and reorganization. In fact, that was what William Pitt the Elder wanted to do, but his health collapsed. However, for my purposes, I needed to have the revolution patched up in early 1778, after the shooting had already started and the Declaration of Independence had been signed. This is a lot more of a stretch. At a minimum, it would require a more reasonable king than George III. So I played some games here. I went back, and my change point takes place at the time of the Glorious Revolution of 1688, when William of Orange became King William III of England. My change point is that the year after that, William and his wife Mary, who in actual history were childless, produce an heir. Now, I admit this is a low-probability event, especially given the persistent, though un unconfirmed, rumors about William's proclivities. However, I indulge myself in this. And so, as a result, at the time the, the, that the American Rebellion takes place, and as far as that goes, in the 23rd century, the House of Orange is still ruling England. And we have a more reasonable king on the throne. I see. So you sort of you, you set up the possibility of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about this George Washington fellow in in, in American history, uh, who sort of turned out to be a British hero in the book? He's looked upon fondly. Yes. Well, in uh, in this alternate history, Washington accepts the rapprochement that is reached in 1778, and in fact, he goes on to lead the Royalist forces to suppress the diehard rebel holdouts led by Benedict Arnold. So, uh, as a result, he's a hero in the, in the expanded British Empire, but considered a villain by the uh, uh, diehard North American separatists, whereas Benedict Arnold is their hero. Uh, as you can see, I'm indulging in a little irony here. Yeah. You even have a, uh, a fellow Virginian a little bit later in the timeline, Robert E. Lee, who who helped preserve the uh, the the empire as well. 
Yeah, he had, he had his role was sort of like that of Jan Smuts after the Boer War, who would, he had led the Boers against the British, but later he became a British general, sort of a military consultant to the British, in fact. Uh, Lee, uh, yeah, I figured that if this happened in real history, it could happen in my alternate history as well. So, um, so yeah, I have Lee leading the rebel forces in the Second American Rebellion, which takes place in the 1850s, but then the British, who are involved in a major war in Europe at the time, decide that this rebellion is an, just an annoying sideshow, so they uh, agree to most of the rebel demands, which uh, defuses the whole thing, And uh, <clears throat> except in New England, throughout this alternate history, New England is always the major hotbed of rebel sentiment, so they allow New England to go its own way as the Commonwealth of New England for a few decades, but eventually they reconquer it because it can't uh, because the people there can't uh, resist fishing in troubled waters. But there is, <clears throat> there's always a simmering sort of uh, uh, resentment uh, in in America of the America that could have been that never was, that is carried forward into your future, and uh, and what has happened? Um, can you can you sort of explain? Uh, where we are in the present by uh, by especially on Tal Chetty Tal Chetty what's happened there uh, oh the, um, oh yes well yes there was always as you say this simmering resentment at least among a minority although by the time of this story most North Americans are totally reconciled to the imperial structure as it exists however about 160 years before the time of the story, there was enough of this uh, sentiment left around so that a group of uh, diehard, irreconcilable North American separatists got together to finance a slower-than-light uh, interstellar colonizing expedition. This was something that had never been tried before. Now, uh, you talk about Todd. Now, Tossetti, uh, the exoplanet hunters have come up with a pretty detailed profile of the planetary system that exists there at Tossetti, and I followed this to the letter. The only liberty I've permitted myself is that there's this one particular fairly massive planet. I'm assuming that the high end of the range of possible mass for it is the correct figure, and that this mass is actually accounted for by a double planet system, the lesser of which is habitable. And, 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 when, and there's nothing impossible about this. But uh, in my alternate history, this is the destination of these colonists. They get on their mm, slower-than-light ship, which the, the Empire has helped them finance, partly to show what wonderful guys they are and partly as a sort of a safety valve to get rid of a uh, mm, troublesome minority. So uh, they set out on their 55-year-old 55 55-year 55 voyage to... Uh, Tossetti in cryogenic suspension. While they're on the way, back on Earth, a faster-than-light drive is developed, and so when they finally arrive at their promised land and come out of cryogenic suspension, the first thing they see is the Union Jack. Major disappointment. Big letdown. <laughs> in fact, Exactly the thing they were fleeing. Uh, in, in fact, at the time of my story, which is a little over a century later, they're still pouting about it. However, they were allowed to start their colony. They were on this planet, which they named New America. So they're kind of under the, the hegemony or the... the, the, the I mean, they're actually ruled by the British, you know, but they, they have set up a, uh, a colonial government. Yeah, well, well, that's interesting. It, it's, uh, there's sort of a... Uh, now, ill-defined semi-autonomy within the empire. The new America is pretty much internally self-governing, but there's uh, an imperial resident commissioner there to sort of keep an eye on things, and there's a Royal Space Navy base there, which is tactfully located far from new America, out in the outer system, and somewhat tactlessly named uh, Washington Station. <laughs> Because the one guy they don't like is that George Washington guy. 
that they have a standing they have a standing offer of dominion status in the empire, which oddly enough they've never availed themselves of. <laughs> so well you so you bring up the technology. Uh, for a while, there was no FTL. Now there is the this thing called the Bernheim Drive. And although it's made up, uh, you do provide some fairly rigid rules for how it operates to make the story interesting. Um, uh, and one of the, you also exploit that in this great short story that we had uh, we had up last month, and it's still available. Um, that that's set in the same world. Um, but we can talk about that later as well, which was out of the vortex. I think it was called. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what the the large technological transportation situation is? Mm -hmm. I'm always telling people at cons that any conscientious science fiction writer knows a lot more about his made-up universe, especially the technology of it, than the reader ever gets to read. <clears throat> this is how you keep yourself honest. You, you create... Uh, definite set of parameters and limitations and you hold themselves you should hold yourself to them so that you can't just pull a new techno rabbit out of your hat every time you write yourself into a corner and uh, the Bernheim drive is a good example of this I have a rather extensive essay on the thing complete with tables and equations and so on but of course I haven't inflicted any of this stuff on the reader the, no, what I'm assuming here is that Bernheim discovered a way to make something like the Alcubierre drive workable. <clears throat> it is not, however, workable within a strong gravity field. So, for example, within well, without well, without going into the facts and figures, within a few thousand miles of an um, Earth-sized planet, <clears throat> it won't work at all. You have to have some kind of reaction drive as a maneuver drive. Once you get beyond this zone, what it can do is essentially fold space in front of your vehicle. It uh, changes the properties of space in order to reduce <coughs> the specific gravity on one side so that basically the, um, the ship is falling forward. And this can produce a pseudo acceleration, which is the equivalent of up to several hundred G's, but the uh, the occupants of the ship can't feel it. They're in free fall unless they have some kind of uh, artificial gravity. Now, once you get further out, when to where the gravity, the so where the sun's gravity field is really weak, uh, and in the case of our solar system, this equates to about as far out as the asteroid belt. There, you can form a warp field around the ship, uh, basically creating sort of a bubble in space time. Which which can propagate faster than light. Now the ship itself inside this bubble isn't breaking the law by traveling faster than light inside this subspace it's created, but the the bubble is moving faster than light. And uh, at the time of my story, the uh, the highest practical pseudo velocity for this is. Going for a ship that's built for speed is in the vicinity of 2,000 times the speed of light. So, um, so it's practical to get from star to star, but not super easy. And there is no such thing as an inter instantaneous interstellar radio that that would uh, run mm -hmm. counter to the kind of atmosphere I want to create. Yeah, so the fastest way to communicate is also via ship. Between the stars, yeah, and uh, and this accounts for the fact of of how um, New America settlers stepped out of their ship they ran into <laughs> the British who had taken like what nine days to get there. Yeah, well, yeah, with an early Bernheim drive ship, the British could make it to Tostetti in a few weeks. <sighs> so, uh, there's some issues with like um, blowing up and such if you if you crank up the warp drive too soon, right? Well, as I said, you have to get out where the the gravity field is very weak in order to safely engage the drive. If you uh, if you monkey around with this, the drive is liable to suffer major damage. 
<laughs> they, they can do, they can do structural da- damage to your ship, in fact. And needless to say, it is as much as a starship captain's career is worth to allow this to happen. Sure. And and this can also become a very good plot device for a science fiction writer. To... Plot device in my earlier short story, A Sudden Stop. Oh, that's right. I'm thinking of A Sudden Stop, actually, that was the... Uh... That that scared this. Um, what is uh, what else have they got? They got uh, there's a lot of needle guns that have that fire some nasty little uh, flechette kind of things. Yes, yes. I uh, <clears throat> I've made the admittedly arbitrary assumption that this timeline has tended to lag about a generation behind ours technologically. For example, they don't develop nukes until the 1970s. However, since uh, my story is taking place in the late 23rd century, that's certainly late enough to incorporate all the usual uh, science fiction toolkit. They've got uh, <clears throat> they got uh, <clears throat> X-ray lasers uh, that they can use as a space weapon. They can generate this without having to blow up a fusion bomb, and they have Gauss guns and so forth. Uh, that, uh, that term, Gauss guns, by the way, reminds me of something else concerning technology. Uh, as I mentioned in my author's note, thing, uh, things like um, antimatter, if they have antimatter power, by the way, and lasers and so forth, uh, it's hardly likely that people in a history as different as this would be using the same terms we do. I mean, the term antimatter was first invented, I believe, in the early 1900s, and the laser, of course, didn't come in until 1959. And when I'm talking about the distances within the Tosetti system, I use the term astronomical units, and uh, that, that, that I think dates to the late 1800s and so forth. So uh, I could have come up with some kind of mumbo jumbo for all this, but I decided against it. I just used these terms anyway, just for the sake of clarity. Mm-hmm. Right, the Gauss gun. But you came up with a. Uh with a good explanation for the for the gas gun, right? I mean, because it's the, you had the scientist. That, that one I can make a case for because he lived in the mid-1700s and my alternate history doesn't start to radically diverge until a little after his time. So, uh, so that I think I can justify. Pull it in. So, all right. So our main character uh, in the story is Robert Rogers. Um, and... I seem to recall a Richard Rogers from our American history, and he was—he is not well liked. Um, is this guy related? I think he is. Oh well, no, 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 uh, no, no. The ancestor I'm thinking of was named Robert Rogers. He was uh, my character. Oh, Robert Rogers. Is, is his namesake, as in addition to being his direct descendant. Now, the Robert Rogers. The the guy from the uh, the French and Indian Wars, who I'm thinking of. I got the first name wrong. Now. Yes. Okay. And he was uh, a sort of a villain during the revolution, right? That was Robert Rogers. He was one of these guys who uh, thrived on war, couldn't handle peace, fell apart afterwards. And then during the uh, American Revolution, he offered to, rain, to raise a new outfit of rangers to fight for the loyalist side. Okay, now, in my alternate history, though, <clears throat> when Rogers comes back to America, by that time, Washington has accepted the rapprochement with England, and so he takes Rogers up on it. And Rogers gets his groove back and uh, forms a second version of Rogers' Rangers and uh, helps Washington suppress the rebel holdouts. In fact, Rogers ends up uh, leading a raid that captures the rebel leader, Benedict Arnold. So uh, needless to say, he is not a great hero to the new Americans. So, all right. So this guy is a is a long descendant of his, and and he he has a certain sort of uh, similarity in that uh, that he's. Well, tell us tell us about our hero, Robert Rogers, Bob Rogers, um, Commander Robert Rogers. That's right. He is a commander in the Royal Space Navy and in, in intelligence. <clears throat> he uh, <clears throat> and he is uh, in terms of his attitudes, beliefs, and so forth. He's a very typical North American of his era. Something of a, almost a James Bond figure with that uh, uh, a bit toned down. 
here, but he um, <clears throat> he he gets this assignment because he's the only uh, North American agent they've got with his special qualifications available at the time. So they decide to so they think that his uh, background might make him blend a little better on New America, in spite of the name. What what is he doing there? What's he looking for? Why did he get sent there? He got sent there to investigate um, possible skullduggery by the Islamic Caliphate there. We haven't gone into the general political situation that's you know on, on earth at this time. Do you want me to go into that first? Yeah, we should do that. There's um, there is an alternate China and it's and its sphere that arose, and there's this this caliphate that is taken to the stars. Right. The uh, yeah the, um, the the British Empire, or uh, to give it its official name in this era, the Britannic Federal Empire, is the strongest power on earth, but it does have rivals. A close second is Greater China, which uh, absorbed Japan some time ago. It's the second most powerful state, and it's not particularly friendly. And then there's, then there's the caliphate. Think ISIS. Here, they're extremely unfriendly. They're, however, they uh, they're also deeply technophobic. Uh, they've had to make adjustments to that in order to be um, <clears throat> competitive. But still, every time the military wants to introduce any sort of innovation, they have to fight the mullahs for it tooth and nail. So th this makes them less effective than they might otherwise be. However, they're always trying to stir up trouble among the, the empire's large Muslim minority and the viceroyalty of India. And then and then there's Russia, which still includes Alaska. Uh, they, uh, I have some stuff about this in my historical timeline, which is included in the novel. Uh, at, at one time, Alaska was sort of a refuge area for the loser in a Russian uh, succession crisis, but uh, uh, so, um, they still have it. And... Then there's the Spanish Empire, which is still in business. Uh, um, they've eventually gotten their act together by reforming along British lines, and uh, they're on pretty good terms with the British. They, uh, this empire also still includes California. Now, Bismarck's unification of Germany never happened in this timeline. So you've got the, the traditional European states, Prussia, France, Austria, and so forth. They're still around, but they're distinctly second-rate powers. Okay, you've, got, you've got the Britannic Federal Empire, whose power centers actually lie in North America, yeah. uh, which is the biggest single power, but it's not the only one. The, the number two power is Greater China which has absorbed Japan, and it's not particularly friendly toward the Brits. The, the caliphate, uh, with these people, uh, think ISIS. They're, they're deeply technophobic, but they've had to make adjustments and accommodations to that if they want to be competitive, but still they're not up to the empire technologically. They do, however, try to to stir up the trouble among the empire's large Muslim minority in the in the vice royalty of India. And then there's Russia, which is still under the czars, and it includes Alaska in this uh, timeline. And then there's the Spanish Empire, which over the centuries has gotten its act together by reforming along British lines, and it's uh, on reasonably good terms with the Brits. And it so includes California. Mm -hmm. the, the European states, well, Bismarck's unification of Germany never took place. Uh, and the, the traditional European states, Prussia, France, Austria, and so forth, still exist, but they're distinctly second-rate powers. Yeah. Now, does the settlement of the stars sort of reflect this reality from Earth? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes, it does. There is, <clears throat> the, <laughs> there's an unspoken realization that uh, all that war on Earth with, with the technology they've got here would be totally disastrous. So uh, uh, they play tricks on each other out in the in the galaxy with the antimatter warheads and the nano disassemblers and so forth. Uh, the, the rest of the galaxy is pretty much fair game for these things, but, um, but Earth is on the limits. 
what is the the caliphate just wants to expand um, and that what what's the reason that they might be involved in the uh, Tau Ceti system this came as a result of um, a tip from the, the Dutch now um, no, do you want me to go back over that again no I think we got that part okay the, okay well anyway the point is the the British and the the Dutch Republic which is still in business in this timeline, are pretty much joined at the hip, and their intelligence services work uh, hand in glove. And the the Dutch also have problems with the caliphate because they too have a large Muslim minority in their <clears throat> Indonesian possessions, and <clears throat> and they've gotten <clears throat> excuse me, they've gotten indications that something is going on in the Tosetti system, which is uh, rather mysterious because the, there are no, there is no Muslim population to try to be infiltrated there. Right. So, um, but somebody, there's been an alarm. That, that there's some information that's come in. Yeah. Yeah. So Rogers has sent uh, Tosetti to <clears throat> follow up on this. Yeah. Okay. So Rogers, Rogers, by the way, did we did we mention that he's an American, which is where the title comes from? He's uh, he's Virginian, right? Yeah, uh, he, he's a, the reason he's Virginian is because some time ago his family, which originally was from New England, moved there. As I said, uh, New England is sort of traditionally the the hotbed of uh, uh, North American separatism and the. Uh, both the North American Rebellion started there, and so uh, his <clears throat> his ancestor, the original Robert Rogers, was not particularly popular there. So eventually, they moved to Virginia, and uh, so that's where he's from. Uh-huh. And so he goes off to New America on a in, in a quiet manner. Um, Arrives, uh, announces himself to the local uh, to the local uh, intelligence operation, which is um, uh, where which is headed by. I mean, it's not headed, but what the representative he meets is is a woman, uh, Gray Golson, right? Um, who does she work for? She has a pretty complicated series of alliances. She is an agent of the New American. <clears throat> Internal Security Agency, which is the uh, an outfit of the of the local government there. As I said earlier, um, New America is very much internally self-governing, and they have their own intelligence agency there, the, the NAISA, and uh, he's assigned to be Rogers' liaison officer. And as you pointed out, she. Uh, has, um, I think the way you put it was a complicated series of alliances. I, I don't want to go into this in detail because I don't want to give too much away, but uh, her relationship with Rogers turns out to be extremely complicated and uh, extremely duplicitous on his side. Basically, he uh, uh, leads her to believe that he has uh, been turned, which in fact he is not, um, and it's amazing he's using her. And uh, when this comes to light, uh, the relationship becomes, shall we say, tense. Hmm. Well, tell us in general terms more about this uh, perfidious, uh, well, it, it seems at, on the surface perhaps not, the Sons of Arnold organization. What's this group up, up to? What's it like when Rogers first okay. encounters it? Okay, as I said, the... Um, <clears throat> The uh, uh, New America is internally self-governing, but they've got a, um, in, uh, <clears throat> you know, their self-government is conducted under the BDI of a, an imperial resident commissioner, and they've got the Royal, the Royal Space Navy base there. And the, the Sons of Arnold is a group which advocates total independence from the Empire. They're, they're not satisfied with this uh, ill-defined semi-autonomy. Now... The mainstream leadership of the Sons of Arnold is nonviolent. They restrict themselves to propaganda and uh, basically trying to, as we would say, raise people's consciousnesses. 
they do, however, include uh, an extremist element, especially among the younger members who believe in violent action. And um, one by, one figure that comes into the uh, the story in that that there's a faction that's named after him is General Wilson, um, who I I confess I didn't know much about, but you uh, you bring up some of the actual backstory of this this <laughs> dude into the story. Uh, Tell us a bit about that, if you don't mind. James Wilkinson. Yes, he Wilkinson. Was, yes, sir. Uh, in in my uh, alternate history, he's. Uh, He's a subordinate of Arnold's, who eventually uh, uh, gets away <clears throat> into French Louisiana, which uh, later becomes part of the British North America. But uh, James Wilkinson, yeah, he, he was another actual historical figure. He, um, he as I uh, as I point out in my author's note, he was without a doubt the most totally consummate scumbag who has ever put on an American uniform. And this guy, he was at the time he was the commanding officer of the United States Army. He was also an agent of Spain. He uh, basically he betrayed every cause he ever embraced. He, he was up to his neck in Aaron Burr's conspiracy to separate the West from the Union, and then he turned around and sold Burr out. He always sold everybody out. I mean, the the guy was just a total slime. But anyway, he's, a, however, in my alternate history, he gets away with some of the <clears throat> irreconcilable elements who escape after Arnold is hanged. So he's become something of a hero uh, in, on New America. Yeah, and there is... Uh... Yeah. One, one, one historian said of, of Wilkinson, he was a general who never won a battle and never lost a court-martial. Yeah, it, he sounds just awful. <laughs> I have to look more into that guy. The, A total scum. But there is um, this this group within a group is is what at first um, at least uh, our Robert Roberts is um, is contending with because it, things get kind of hairy quickly in in the story. Um, it's the you know it's a twisty thriller so we don't really want to give too much away on it. Um, one other question I had is, in the larger spread of humanity to the stars have have they encountered aliens in this universe? What are they like and what are the are there possibilities for more nefarious aliens? Well, as you say, we don't want to give too much away. Therefore, I don't want to go in <clears throat> go into too much about this. But uh, the, the answer is yes, they have encountered aliens who are tool-using and have spoken language, and as far as such things can be measured, seem to be as in, about as inherently intelligent as humans. But they've never encountered an alien race that was above the Mesolithic level of technology. The, they've come to the conclusion, therefore, that civilization is a freak and arose on Earth for some in some way or another, they haven't decided how, but it, it's uh, it's uh, completely abnormal development. Most in tool-using races are content to pretty much stay on that level. However, uh, too much spoiler, let's just say that the... Uh, Sons of Arnold extremists and the Caliphate people turn out to have some highly unexpected allies. <laughs> there's one other. Uh, there's one other component to uh, to the universe that exists. Uh, in addition to the book, there. Well, there's two. There's um. There's the story in in uh, Star Destroyers uh, that we were mentioning. There's also um, a story that's out at free at Free Short Stories twenty. 18 at Bay and Ebooks now, and it's also still up on the web, uh, and it was uh, on our front page for a while. This is uh, a really cool story about another universe that might exist where uh, George Washington played a very different role, um, and there's a different uh, different future. Um, tell us a little bit about that story, because I've, I found it a real... Um, I love the story, first of all, and, it, and it's an intriguing uh, sort of entry point that might get people interested in Her Majesty's American. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was in out of the vortex. 
This takes place uh, shortly after Her Majesty's American, and the viewpoint character here is a Royal Space Navy officer who has been assigned, very much against his will, to nurse made a scientific expedition, <clears throat> which is making inquiries on what might have happened to a new American physicist who had lived a couple of generations before. Now, this guy, the, the physicist, was bit, <clears throat> considered a bit of a genius, but also a bit of a crank. And he was obsessed with the concept of alternate universes. And <clears throat> he was also, uh, without being a member of the Sons of Arnold, he was also an extremely vociferous believer in <clears throat> new American independence and believed that the, uh, the solution to the first American rebellion had been a real tragedy and things would be much better if it had gone the other way. But you know, these two <clears throat> aspects of his personality take and in tandem meant that he was firmly convinced that somewhere there was a universe in which things had turned out right. So uh, he used his considerable inherited fortune to get an expedition to go out into the outer system where he believed he could create a device for accessing alternate realities, but then he was never heard from again. So uh, in my story, they go out to try to find out what happened to him, and they discover this mysterious vortex and something uh, very... Uh, some, well, some very intriguing things come out of it, one of which is, well, that unfortunately, uh, a battle takes place. I don't want to go into the details because that would give too much away. But in the end, uh, as a result of a ship blowing up at exactly the wrong place, the vortex disappears. Nothing is left except uh, small bits of wreckage. One of these bits of wreckage is a tail assembly of a space fighter, which has a flag painted on it, which is... That's hauntingly familiar. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to, to, because the, uh, uh, to my viewpoint character, who, who is a North American and knows something about history, and, uh, and he, he remembered what the flag of the North American rebels had looked like. Yeah. And, 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 this, and, and this, uh, this one is uh, awfully similar, but has a lot more stars. <laughs> Well, that's a great story, Out of the Vortex, and uh, it leads into a great book uh, that um, that's highly enjoyable uh, adventure and incredibly intriguing sort of alternate future. Um, the book is Her Majesty's American by Steve White, and it's at booksellers everywhere. Uh, right now, I'm developing a sequel to it. Excellent. Um, well, Steve, thank you so much for talking with us about Her Majesty's American. Thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to do so. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. The promotion ceremony was over. Only two acolytes had attained senior status this season, not nearly enough to make up for attrition and their dwindling numbers, 
But one showed great promise, and far more importantly, the other possessed a sword that could supposedly defeat armies. Mindarin was excited at the prospect. However, Lord Protector Atul seemed to be in a worse mood than usual. The Hall of the Protectors was a vast stone fortress cut from the mountainside, far too large for their dwindling numbers. Mindarin joined his commander on the balcony overlooking the empty training ground. I've been told that in times past, our numbers were so great that our formations took up this whole space when they presented themselves for inspection. Ratul snorted. We used to be so respected that we received so many obligations that we had to turn some away. I can't even imagine. Now we can barely fill one corner with children. So this is what it feels like to preside over a dying order. But then, I wonder if it truly has to be that way. The acolytes were gone, allowed a few hours to celebrate some of their numbers successfully advancing, or to mourn the one who hadn't made it back. It was their choice. Ratul went back to staring off into space, sucking on his teeth, mulling over something. What troubles you? Mindaran asked. The truth. That's an unusually cryptic pronouncement. You saw something strange at the heart, didn't you? Any other acolyte and I would have cut him down on the spot. But the Order needs that sword. Ratul sighed. Dark times are coming, my friend. Mindaran felt his hopes dashed. Ashok, then. Did you receive a prophecy? Such a thing was rare, but not unheard of when dealing with the heart. Did it show you his future? Ratul spit over the edge and watched it fall. Bah, I'm weary from the journey. That mountain seems taller the older I get. I don't want to talk about it now. It'll be dealt with in time. Good night, Mindarin. He left the rail and began to walk away. Did the heart show you the future? Mindarin called after him. No. Ratul didn't look back. It showed me the past. Chapter 7 As the sun rose across the desert, the spires of the capital's tallest towers were visible in the distance. It was the biggest city in Lok. There was no place farther from the sea, and thus purer, than the capital. Kept alive by endless caravans and mighty aqueducts, the city had grown out of this barren region to spite nature. It was the source of the law, the home of the bureaucracy, and the depository of mankind's knowledge. It was in the middle of a desert, in the center of the continent, and though no rivers flowed here, all power did. He had crossed jungles, mountains, plains, and desert, both low and high, over the last few weeks. Riding from before dawn until after dusk, driving horses to exhaustion or death, and then using his office to confiscate more from the next town. Ashok had commandeered barges to cross rivers, climbed thousands of feet to cross mountain passes where the air was so thin that it made his head ache, and traveled hundreds of miles on the trade roads. He'd passed dozens of villages, a handful of cities, more caravans than he could count, and had dispatched one gang of bandits stupid enough to mistake him for a normal traveler in the dark. All of that brought him here, to the shadow of Mount Metoro, to the greatest city in the world. Protector Ashok Vidal, 20 years senior, was not happy to be here. A wise man once told me that the place where they make law is the place where they're the least likely to obey it. Ashok muttered as he watched the spires. Of course, his only companion had no response but to snort and flick an ear. The horse was exhausted. That was too bad. It was his last mount. There were still miles to go, and now that the sun was up, they needed to go faster. He thumped the animal with his heels. My apologies, horse. 
I don't like this place either. The duties of his office had taken him to nearly every city on the continent. Most of them were surrounded by the smelly farms and smoking industries of the workers, with scattered compounds belonging to the warrior caste between them, the slums for the castless in the least desirable locations, and all of those quarters existed to serve the will of the much smaller governing caste, who usually lived in some form of central castle or palace, separate and aloof. That's how society normally worked for the good and order of mankind. The capital was different from every other city. There were still multitudes of workers who lived here to serve, and legions of warriors to defend it, but this was a city built from the ground up for the comfort of the greatest among men. There were disproportionate numbers of the ruling caste here. Within every caste were numerous sub-castes, and levels within levels, until every man had a place. This was where the greatest among them gathered to conduct their houses' affairs. The lowliest bureaucrats still had rank and connections beyond an outsider's dreams. Every home was a palace, and each agency of the bureaucracy required a building that made those palaces look like a castless shack. The horse shifted nervously beneath him as it caught the scent of death on the desert wind. Easy, horse. They have to hang the criminal somewhere. They certainly couldn't do it in town, where the governing caste would have to smell them rot. To the north, separate from the city, high up the side of lonely Mount Metoro, was a familiar fortress. His dried-out eyes could barely make out the clouds of black dots dancing over the Inquisitor's dome. Vultures. Hundreds of them. The executioners must have been busy lately, and recently, too, if the smell of decay was this strong, because bodies turned to jerky quickly under this sun. The only good thing about his new orders was that he'd not been requested here by the Inquisition. When a protector was summoned by the anonymous men in the masks and hoods, it was usually to deal with a lawbreaker using illegal magic, but once in a great while it was to be interrogated themselves. It was rare for a protector to be questioned, but the law declared that no one was above suspicion. Everyone answered to someone. Protectors answered to the Inquisition. Ashok would submit to their tortures if ordered, but he wouldn't enjoy it. The capital was strange. It belonged to no house, but all houses heeded it. It produced nothing but words, but it was the richest city in the world. All houses had their own form of currency, but the capital issued banknotes which could be traded and honored by all. The houses supplied the capital with resources and people, and in exchange, the capital gave them law. Along the road, Ashok passed dozens of wagons flying the banners of many different houses. He thought about stopping one of the caravans to trade for a fresh horse, but by the time he dealt with all the needless pleasantries, announcements, and workers sucking up, he wouldn't be saving any time. Since he'd dressed in his full uniform for his presentation in the capital, he stuck out, and many of the drivers became obviously fearful when they saw a protector approaching. Since it was legal for any enforcer of the law to requisition whatever he needed to fulfill his orders, many poor merchants had been deprived of their goods along this very road after hauling them all the way across the continent. Ashok knew there would be many sighs of relief as he passed them by, unmolested. One eventually got used to being feared by nearly everyone he met. The walls of the capital were too thin and constructed of sandstone. They existed primarily for decoration and would never survive a siege. The capital's real defenses were made of ink and paper, no matter how far it might drift from the letter of the law, no house would ever make war on the capital because there would be several other houses ready to curry political favor by turning on their neighbor. It was a careful balancing act, but it had kept the peace for hundreds of years. The city never stopped growing. It had been a few years since his last visit, and he marveled at how many new structures there were. 
and how many old ones had been torn down and rebuilt. For the source of all order in the world, it was certainly chaotic. The headquarters of the Order of Protectors were just inside the gate, between one of the vast bazaars and a worker's neighborhood. This position was strategic, separate from the decision-makers, but close enough to still take order. Compared to the rest of the government buildings, it was humble. Compared to the rest of the Order's holdings across the continent, it was ostentatious. Much like the walls, this building was also for show. The real, literal heart of the Order was in the rugged mountains of Devacula, far to the south. The bazaar was a packed mass of humanity, jostling about in the shade of hundreds of tents. The stalls came and went as merchants struck it rich or went broke. The arbiters and regulators didn't usually bother with this area until someone important complained. Some fool was trying to sell elephants, and the poor beasts looked miserable in the heat. Their giant piles of dung covered half the road. The road that had been here the last time he'd visited was now blocked by someone selling chickens. A new path through had been created where there had been a spice merchant before. This lack of continuity offended Ashok. Protect your business. Make a hole. Most people were quick enough to get out of his way. Though his horse did knock over a few workers, they were of low enough rank that nobody would notice. You must have some war horse in your blood. Ashok congratulated his mount. The order's compound was a prestigious posting for the warrior caste, so the soldiers guarding the entrance were always alert, and they had spotted his uniform above the crowd. Who approaches? One of them shouted. Ashok Vidal, twenty years senior. The horse seemed very pleased to stop. You are expected protector, one of the guards said as he took the reins. Ashok slid out of the saddle. Take care of this animal. It's been tougher than expected. He patted the foaming beast on the neck, then walked through the inner courtyard. Several acolytes were crudely sparring, which consisted of mercilessly beating each other with padded sticks. It was good to see that there were so many of them. Though they remained a small, elite organization, over the last decade their numbers had grown. As the protectors had regained their status, the houses had obligated an increasing number of recruits, and since no one wanted to be outdone, they only sent their best. The acolyte running the drills saw him coming and snapped at his younger charges to get out of the way. They quickly formed a line and bowed. Ashok didn't know any of them, so he gave but a small nod in greeting as he passed them by. He could hear them whispering behind his back. Black-hearted Ashok, the finest killer who has ever lived. He didn't know them, but they knew of him. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a rousing rendition of God Save the Queen from those nasty American separatists sung to the tune of We're Not Gonna Take It by The Who, which in this universe is not a British band, but hails from Asbury Park, where they all met at that bar owned by the Springsteen dude who never quite had a hit. Plus, thanks and praise to Steve White, author of Her Majesty's American. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. 